Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today I wanted to do a very quick crash course into the main standard issue sidearms used by most of the countries involved in World War II. Now I know quite a few more than these were actually used in World War II, but these are the main ones that you see pop up, whether you're doing a brief historical research, playing a video game, watching a movie. So these are the ones I'm going to focus on. Again, this is just going to be a very quick summary just to give some basic information of each of these and their usage in World War II. So if that sounds interesting to you, please stick around that's coming up now okay now starting things off we're going to start with the sidearms issued by the united states in world war ii now we're starting here because i'm american and because of my patriotic bias so with that out of the way the uh, let's go ahead and start. Now nah, let's go ahead and start with the 1911. So in the First World War, just prior to the First World War, the United States had adopted the 1911 sidearm, as the name would suggest, in 1911. Go in production, it would really start being made in pretty big numbers by about 1912-1913. These were 45 ACP, single action only, feeding from a seven-round attachable box magazine. Now, by the time the United States would be involved in the Second World War, they had had these under a good amount of production, but there were not quite enough available yet to supply everybody who might need a sidearm, especially those in ancillary support roles. So they would commission Colt and Smith & Wesson for a 45 caliber revolver. Now, they would want to stay with the same cartridge because the 1911 is chambered in 45 ACP. Logistically, you do not want two sidearms to have different uh, types of ammunition. And if you can, in any type of military application, you want to keep your ordnance supply down to two or a maximum of three calibers. Going beyond that, logistics starts becoming a huge issue. You start ending up with a huge amount of firearms that might end up in one location that you cannot supply with ammunition. So they would want this to be in 45 ACP. Now Colt had already been working on a large frame revolver uh, in about 1909, 1910 in 45. So the you know, the uh, production of this was actually a pretty quick transition for Colt. Smith & Wesson also would produce the 1917 revolver. They would have some stylistic differences, but they would function more or less the same way. Now, being a, uh, a semi-automatic or a pistol caliber in a revolver, a pistol cartridge in a revolver that does not have a rim, you would typically have to load this with moon clips, either a full or a half moon clip, which is a circular ring with notches cut into it that you could slide the rims of the casing into so that when you put them into the revolver, your extractor or ejector rod could actually pick them up and push them out easily. This is a double single action revolver. Now, why are we talking about World War I era firearms when we're talking about the World War II time period? Well, the United States in the interwar period, like a lot of other countries, had worked on revamping their armaments. Now, a lot of what they had used in the First World War did carry over to the Second World War. This was true of the 1911 and the 1917 revolver. Uh, this would be true of the 1903 Springfield. This would also be true of things like the 1917 A1 water-cooled machine gun, which again, all, all saw service through the end of the Second World War. Now, in the interwar period, some revisions have been made, specifically on the 1911. This got revamped into the 1911 A1. The A is typically known as the alteration, so alteration one. In US military armament nomenclature, anytime there's an alteration, you add a one or a two or a three after an A. So 1911 A1, the M16 is M16, then M16 A1, M16 A2, A3. Um, trying to think the M1 Thompson was the M1 then the M1A1. Um, so that's typically how it is. Now, changes that can quickly identify an A1 or scallops cut into the frame. Uh, you have a bulged mainspring housing, these brownish keys fibrite grip panels, typically a military parkerized finish, a shorter uh, trigger here. Uh, and those are sort of the quick identifiers. Now, uh, these would be manufactured mainly by three firms. Um, Ithaca out of New York, you would have Remington, Rand, and Colt. You would also have Union Switch and Signal and to a much lesser ex extent Singer uh, Sewing Machine Company, which made, I believe, less than a thousand, but their manufacturing was so precise they quickly moved them on to other uh, war material production. 
Now, when we're talking about the ancillary sidearm of the 1917s, production on these did not really continue in through the Second World War, but there were a lot of these in supply. So these would see a lot of use back home with you know military police or local guard units and things like that. Now, about 20,000 of these did go overseas and did serve in some ancillary roles against support roles abroad in Europe and Japan and, and places like that. So these did see a significant amount of use in World War II, both civil use uh, back stateside uh, and a little bit of you know special occupational use, if you will, um, overseas as well. But the 1911 was, of course, a standard issue sidearm. So uh, anyway, if you're looking at getting into collecting United States pistols, um, you can get into a 1911, you know, through the CMP. They're a little bit cheaper if you're getting like a reworked or rebuilt 1911. I believe they're, you know, going uh, around the thousand dollar mark plus or minus. If you get a really nice, correct uh, original finish example of, you know, again, a Remington Rand Colt or Ithaca, and it's typically in that order, Remington Rand, then uh, it, then uh, Colt, then Ithaca in terms of collectability. Um, you know, a really good example could could uh, go well over $2,000. Getting into Union Switch and Signal, those definitely go up, and then the Singers are, if you have an original Singer, those are upwards in, you know, the sixty dollars to $80,000 or so. The 1917 revolvers, either by Smith or by Colt, in good condition, typically top out around seven or eight hundred dollars. I've seen pristine, unissued examples, maybe at around twelve, but seven to eight in really good condition is typically about what you find. And these are not original grip panels for this. They would have been just a slab side without checkering or anything. So anyway, that's your summary on the United States. Let's go ahead into Germany. Okay, jumping into Germany. Germany was a very pistol citric country when it came to their military application and doctrine. Um, in 1939, Germany would, of course, invade Poland, and they would continue their sort of expansionism through Europe uh, through about 1943-1944. Now, they would, of course, invade Poland, Belgium, uh, France, and one of the things they would do when they would occupy a country is they would quickly seize the arms manufacturing, continuing production, and folding a lot of those firearms into German military service. Now, one of the types of firearms that they did this the most with would, of course, been handguns. So when we're looking at Germany, there is a huge variety of different firearms that Germany did issue, whether they manufacture them at home, like the Lugers and the P-38s or the PPs, the PPKs, the HSCs, the C-96 broom handle Mausers, things like that, or the captured firearms that they folded into military service. I could do a full-length video just on those firearms, and I have many of them, and maybe I will. But these are typically the two that you see associated with military service in Germany in the Second World War. So for the purposes of this video, we're going to focus on these. The story with this, again, predates World War I, and this one is started. This is, of course, the P08 Luger in 9mm. It is a single stack magazine, and it is a toggle lock type system. It does have a manual of safety, and it, of course, is probably the most iconic World War II, even though it's really more pre-World War I era. But you think of World War II sidearms, the Luger is typically what comes to most people's mind. Now, this would start with Georg Luger. Back when he was working with DWN, that's Deutsche Waffen und Munitionsfabriken, in Germany. Now, he had been working loosely under, I wouldn't really say under, but with Hugo Borchardt, who had designed the C93 Borchardt pistol, which was also toggle locked or had a toggle link system, if you will. But it was very large, very cumbersome, very awkward balance, very complicated and expensive to produce. So he took the general, I guess you would say, nudge from that design concept, scaled it into something that can actually be more practical for military application, and he would come out with this, the Luger. Now, many, many countries would adopt Luger in many different variations. Uh, there was, of course, adopted by German Army in 1908, which is where it gets the P08 Luger. You had the Navy variants, you had the artillery variants. Um, so, of course, that would go on to, to be expected. Now, in World War I, this would have been the standard issue sidearm. Again, it would not come without problems. It is still expensive and complicated to manufacture. You do have a lot of parts in here, and because the tolerances are so tight, especially with conditions in you know, trench warfare in World War I, they were known to be prone to stoppages. So we get through, you know, the end of World War I, of course, Germany loses the war, and due to the armistice treaties, they are no longer able to produce war material. Now, when Hitler comes to power, one of the first things he does is he revamps the military program in Germany, but he has to do so pretty much in secrecy and in silence. So they start coming up with new technology. You have development of new machine guns like the MG34, uh, and they're looking at re-beginning production of the Luger. 
Now in 1934 and 1935, they produced the Lugers at Mauser uh, with the K date and the G date codes over the top of the breech. Uh, this is of course to hide, you have codes that hide the manufacturer's name and the years of production. Uh, but they're also working on coming up with a new type of technology that's going to be, again, easier and cheaper to produce fewer parts and it's going to be more reliable in the field. So a couple years after that, they come out with the, the P-38, of course, in 1938. This is just a year before the invasion of Poland. Now they still continue production of the Mauser, or I'm sorry, of the Luger mainly at Mauser through about 1942. But they would keep up with production of the P-38 until the end of the war in 1945. Now other manufacturers would continue production of the Luger, like Kriegoff being a big one, and Simpson and Sewell and things like that. The P-38 was mainly produced by Mauser, Spreework, and Walther. Those would be denoted by codes CYQ for Spreework, BYF for Mauser, and uh, da -da -da -da, AC, right? AC for Walther. Yep, this is an AC-44, so this is a Walther manufactured P-38. Again, you have a single stack, nine millimeter, and this one is now a double single action. So your hammer uh, fired firearm, you could chamber around, put yourself into single action. Of course, if you get a light primer strike, you could pull through again and now you're in double action. Or if you want to chamber around and holster, you can put it on safe and it's a decocker. This would be a design springboard for later things to come like the, um, the PHP MV9 in Croatia or the, uh, of course, the very famous Beretta uh, 92FS M9 handguns that exist today. So this was a design that that really spurred a lot of development for other things. If you're looking and getting into collecting German sidearms, uh, there are cheaper ones that you can get associated with German service. But if you're looking specifically at these, of course the P-38s are going to be generally more affordable. They range in value from Spreework to Mauser to Walther in terms of their collectability and desirability on the market. Of course they are numbered. Uh, P-38s are going to be numbered on the slide, the, uh, the locking block internally, the barrel and the frame. If you get an all matching, really nice example, they're topping in a lot of cases over $1,000. Uh, you can get more shooter grade ones for probably in the $600 range or so, you know, refinish, non matching, things like that. Now, the Lugers, on the other hand, tend to vary a little bit more. This one is actually manufactured by Airfort in World War I. The World War I era, either DWM or Airfort uh, Lugers, tend to go for a little bit less than World War II era Lugers in similar conditions. So there's just a little bit more of a collector's market on the World War II two era stuff. Uh, if you get an original all matching original finish, Mauser manufactured Luger, you know, those are typically in about $1,500 plus. You can get more rare variations like K or G dated or what they call the Black Widow which would be 1941 or 1942 with the black Bakelite grips. Now in 1937, they would all be blued, so you would get rid of these small straw, straw parts, so an all black appearance, which is where it gets the collector's term. Those tend to go for a little bit more. It's kind of funny because it's really collectors that added a lot of the perceived value to those, in my opinion, uh, but there's that. Now, if you get something really unique, like a Kriegoff or a Simpson Luger, uh, those can be exorbitantly expensive. Of course, your artillery and your Navy Lugers go for a little bit more too, typically starting around, uh, you know, the low twos or so in matching condition, uh, depending on the year manufactured, who made it and what it comes with. So uh, interesting firearms. And of course, the German stuff is usually the most coveted and collected. Okay, next, let's get into Japan. What I have here is a Type 14 Nambu and a Type 94 Nambu pistol, both of these chambered in the eight millimeter Nambu round. Now, both of these are the brain children of Kijiro Nambu, who was somewhat of a John Moses Browning in Japan at the time. So accredited for a lot of small arms development in Japan that saw a lot of use in the Second World War. Things like the Type 11 machine gun, the Type 96 and 99, and even the Type 100 submachine gun were all designs of Kijiro Nambu. Uh, so taking a look at these handguns. First, if we get back into the 1800s, Japan had been issuing the Type 26 service revolver, which a lot of countries were issuing at the time, a revolver. Now we get into the, and get into the turn of the century, a lot of militaries around the world, especially in the West, are moving into semi-automatic pistol development. There was a lot of influence from Western military technology into Japan. I did a very in-depth video on the Type 11 uh, light machine gun. I'll link it down in the description. And we talk a lot about 
uh, uh, Japanese military philosophy at the time as it applied to the Type 11, but a lot of the same uh, doctrines would apply to the other armaments at the time as well. So they're wanting to get into a semi-automatic pistol design, so Kajiro Nambu starts work on his preliminary design concepts, out of which would come what collectors call the Grandpa Nambu or the t Type A Nambu pistol, which is very complicated to manufacture, very difficult to manufacture, a little bit large and clunky, uh, somewhat of what we see of er uh, early uh, German Luger design and the, the C93 Porsche art and things along that nature. Now he would revise it down to what collectors would call the Papa Nambu and then finally settle on the Type 14. Now the Type 14 would actually be adopted into Japanese service in 1926, which was actually the 14th year of Emperor Taisho's reign. German, uh, I keep saying German, Japanese calendars were, um, you know, dictated, you usually take the, the current sitting emperor, the first year that they gained power, came into power, and then you add on to it the subsequent years of when something eventful would happen, like the development of this in 1926 would be called the Type 14 because it occurred in the 14th year of Emperor Taisho's reign. Uh, this was a good... Uh, adaptation or at least a good semi-automatic sidearm and was really the first hugely scaled and produced a sidearm that would be of course seen in large numbers in World War II. Now earlier ones would have a very small trigger guard, uh, later they would go into this extended trigger guard for use with gloves and things like that. Earlier ones also had uh, more intricately machined cocking knobs, later they would go into just this sort of diamond cut texturing here. Uh, in the back. So some simplification uh, had, did happen with their armaments through the progression of the war as of course they were losing, losing resources and things like that. Now uh, a couple years after the adoption of the Type 14, uh, Kajiro Nambu was also working on another sidearm, a smaller more concealable version which could be offered to vehicle drivers, pilots, and things like that also is going to be smaller than the Type 14 and more affordable to manufacture. So this comes about and is adopted for Japanese service in 1934, which is the Japanese calendar year 2594, which is where it gets the name, the Type 94. Also an 8mm Nambu feeding from a single stack magazine. Very awkward and weird design both of these are, and both very complicated to disassemble and maintain. Now. Japan didn't really have standard issue sidearms as we would know it in, you know, in Germany or the United States where they would be manufactured and issued out as standard military armament. Uh, with officers and things like that, they were given the option to purchase these firearms separate from what would be supplied to them. A lot of them keeping in, in correlation with their nationalistic pride would purchase Japanese manufactured firearms course you know you're fighting for Japan why go purchase firearms elsewhere but a lot of them did you would see things like the Colt 1903 pocket hammerless show up in Japanese service as being purchased and believed by those who carry them to be superior to these and you kind of you wouldn't see why they wouldn't think that but um, some interesting features of the type 94 of course your cocking handle is here at the top that's how you would chamber around. Now, this is famous for being the so-called surrender pistol, where you have an exposed trigger bar on the exterior on the left-hand side of the pistol, which you can push, and we know this is unloaded, and that would, you heard that click, that would actually fire the firearm. So it's said that they would hold their pistol like this, like they're gonna surrender it, and then before the, the unassuming GI took it, they would push on the trigger bar and discharge around and, and you know that sort of thing. There's no real account of that actually happening. I just think that it was just a weird and awkward design feature, not intended to be a deceptive thing at all. But what it did lead to was some unintentional discharging of the firearm where tank personnel or vehicle drivers might discharge around into the floor or their leg, and, and a lot of times that did happen. So it did have that unintended consequence. So if you do pick something like this up, you have to be careful about that. Of course, these did serve through the end of the Second World War, both of them, so it was common for both of these to come home as war trophies with GIs uh, in World War II as well. Now on the collector market, uh, as far as Japanese arms collecting goes, it is a little bit less desirable than German and American firearms, at least here in the United States. You can typically pick up a nice all-matching Type 14 Nambu pistol 
uh, typically about seven, eight hundred dollars is where they go. If it's got its full rig with a uh, sort of rubberized uh, holster, they can go up from there. Uh, the Type 94s, last I checked, were in about the seven to eight hundred dollar range in matching condition. So both of these are easily sub thousand dollar guns. If you're looking into getting into Japanese arms collecting, both are affordable and both are very unique and iconic. Okay, up next we're going to move over to Russia. What I have here is a model of 1895 Nagant revolver, chambered in 762 by 38 R or rimmed. And we have a Tokarev TT-33 chambered in 762 by 25. Now the story would really begin here with the 1895 Nagant revolver, but first, if we go back in time a little bit, Russia had actually been issuing the Smith & Wesson number no. three pattern revolver, which at the time wasn't actually made by Smith & Wesson. Originally, they had contracted with Smith to make them. Smith & Wesson made several of them, but then they contracted with other firms locally and in Germany uh, to come up with a copy. So that's what they were manufacturing. Now they wanted to move into something that was going to be a little less large, something smaller, more compact, easier to manufacture. So they had been working with Leon Nagant, who they already knew and trusted as an arms designer because of his part in the Mosin Nagant rifle, which Russia had adopted in 1891, 762x54R. He had been working on this in Liège, Belgium. He submitted it to Russia for their trials, and Russia decided to adopt it in 1895. Now, the interesting philosophy of this is it's much kind of like a single-action army in some ways, is you do have a side-loading gate right here on the right-hand side, an ejector rod which pops out of the frame and pivots over. You can eject your cartridges between, you know, your firing cycles or whatever. Uh, close it, and then, of course, it goes to... Uh, single action if you want to fire in single action or it's a full double action. Now it is a very heavy trigger pull and double action. This is what is known as a gas seal revolver. You'll notice as I pull the trigger, the uh, cylinder will actually move into the forcing cone of the barrel and create a full gas seal. See, move forward and then back. This is to my knowledge actually the only revolver that can be suppressed for that reason. So interesting design. The 38, the 762 by 38 r actually had a projectile recessed into the uh, casing, so it was you know fully encompassed and sealed when it was pushed up against the forcing cone. It's a pretty interesting concept. Now this would actually stay in Russian service well past uh, the end of the Second World War. Now in the interwar period between World War I and World War II, like most other countries around the world, Russia is looking at improving on its armament. They started handgun trials in about 1929, 1930, and I'll talk about that in a minute. They started revamping on the surface rifle, the 1891 in 1930, giving it the 9130 designation, which is the type of, you know, the Mosin Nagant 9130 is what most of us have in our collections today, and was the one that was more typically serving in the Second World War. They had a semi-automatic rifle program, which led into the SVT-38 and SVT-40, and of course a handgun program where they wanted to come up with a more modern semi-automatic uh, handgun, which would replace the revolver. I believe there were about seven submissions in 1930, one here by Fedor Tokarev, which ended up winning the contract in 1930 as the model 1930. Now this is not a 1930, this is a 1933 TT-33, which three years after its adoption would see some revisions and then the TT-33 model would, would become, uh, I guess you would say, standard issue. Although it was meant to be standard issue, it never really became standard, standard issue. So by the time the Finnish Winter War begins prior to World War II, uh, Russia does not have enough SVT-38s and SVT-40s in supply, or I guess I should say SVT-38s. Uh, they do not have enough TT-33s, so the 9130 and the 1895 Nagant revolver be, uh, would stay as the primary issue firearms, the main infantry rifle and handgun throughout that period into the Second World War, and the SVT-38 to then later the SVT-40 and the TT-30 and TT-33 pistols would actually remain as ancillary support, you know, uh, gap fillers, if you will. Um, so that's basically about, you know, the history on that. Now, uh, the TT-33 is a single stack magazine fed 762 by 25. It is a single action only, similar to a 1911, and there are some similar 1911-esque features about this. You can definitely see the influences. Um, and that's basically about it on that. Now, if you're looking at collecting Russian pistols, the Nagant revolver actually for all World War II sidearm collecting is going to be the most affordable. Uh, these would come into the country, I remember 10 or so years ago, these things were coming in by the pallet load and you could typically pick one up in a refurbed and import marked condition like this one for about $100. 
Now in this condition, they're going for about $300 or so. Uh, if you find one with original finish and all matching uh, without import marks, typically you know, you're seeing those $500 to $700 or so. So they're definitely climbing in value. Um, the TT33s, uh, this is an original World War II era Russian manufactured TT33 made in 1939 does have the CCCP grips, uh, and it's mostly sort of a brownish patina, so nice World War II use, nothing over collectible about this. And something like this would start in about the $1,000 range. Uh, if you get a premium condition, original finish, and you know 90% or better all matching, they can climb upwards of about the $2,000 range, so they are pretty pricey for what they are. Now, Post-World War II in the 1950s, around 1951, these would both be replaced by the, by the uh, Makarov pistols and Makarov PM. A lot of the uh, Russian technology, like the TT-33 design and the Makarov design, would be adopted by other Comblock countries during the Cold War. So you can find TT-33 models having been made by Poland, by China, uh, by uh, Yugoslavia, uh, and so if you, uh, by Romania too, so if you find those, those are typically more affordable between about three and five hundred dollars, so even though they won't have real ties to World War II Russian history, if you want one, they're still true to form and function, as a gap filler or just a shooter, you can still pick up one of those TT33s again for usually five hundred or less in most cases, so anyway, that will be the two sidearms used by Russia in World War II. Okay, let's go ahead and move into Great Britain. What I have here is a Webley Mark IV uh, revolver chambered in 38200, or also known as the 38 Smith & Wesson, uh, the 38200, 38 caliber, 200 grain projectile. Now, this was not actually the standard issue sidearm uh, issued by Great Britain in World War II. That was actually the Enfield Number no. 2 Mark I and Mark I Star. But this was very similar as we'll go through the history and also adopted as ancillary service. I just don't have the other uh, models available for filming this, but I will touch on them as we go through the history. Now, in World War I, Great Britain was issuing the Webley Mark VI revolver. It was chambered in 455. It was very large and very heavy. You remember that 1917 revolver? Similar in stature and weight, and it was a large caliber, close to the 45 ACP. In fact, a lot of people take those Mark VI's and shave down the cylinder to accommodate a 45 ACP round, destroying collectability, in my opinion, but leads to a more affordable shooting. Um, in the interwar period, we've discussed this with every other country we've looked at, Great Britain, like everybody else, wanted to modernize and, and, and implement advancements in their military technology. Now, they liked the Mark VI revolver. The fit, the finish, the function, the quality was excellent. Webley was known for both their military production and their commercial production as putting together really finely made revolvers. So, uh, Great Britain wanted to have a scaled down version and a smaller caliber and more inexpensively produced variation of the Mark VI. So, Webley would get to work and come out with what was known as the Mark IV, which is this. Uh, again, 38 caliber, still a very well manufactured, very uh, attractive looking firearm. Uh, this is a wartime gun, and I'll talk about that. Um, but this is what they had come up with. Now, Webley had expected. Uh, you know, Britain to go ahead and adopt their design and to implement it into their armed forces, but they were thrown a, a curveball when the RSAF, that's the Royal Small, Small Arms Factory of Enfield, is commissioned to actually make a very close copy of this revolver, known again as the Number 2 Mark I. And that would happen in 1931. Now, Webley would sue and uh, would sue Enfield, which was owned by the country, um, and, and patent infringements. But they would ultimately lose that lawsuit, getting a little bit of a you know monetary uh, sort of a, what I want to say reimbursement for their work and R&D on, on the revolver. But they would go ahead and press forward forward with the number two Mark One, virtually identical to this with some minor internal changes. Um, 1938, they would come out with the number two Mark I Star, which the main difference, or the quickest way you could tell the difference between that and the uh, and the number two Mark I, is it had a spurless hammer, double action only. Now, by the time World War II had kicked off, we remember Dunkirk and everything that was happening with uh, huge loss of personnel and equipment. There was the Lindley's program with the United States manufacturing Enfields and Thompsons and uh, uh, the Victory revolvers from Smith & Wesson and all sorts of different things. Uh, uh, Great Britain was in, in desperate need for war material going into the Second World War, so they would go ahead and commission anyway with Webley to produce the Mark IV revolvers for military service as well. 
So this, very similar to the number two Mark I, but also a wartime gun. Now, a quick way that you can tell that this is a wartime gun, and this is a pretty funny thing about Webley in general, is again, I had mentioned, they had a huge stake in the commercial market. They were known for manufacturing beautifully finished and well fit and tuned guns for, uh, for the commercial market, for sports enthusiasts and things like that. And their revolvers were no exception. They had this beautiful bluing on them, but the government wanted quick, uh, quickly manufactured, cheaply manufactured, cheap finish on them, which is not quite up to snuff with what Webley wanted to produce for their firearms. So when they put out these very crudely finished revolvers, they actually stamped war finish on the frame so that anybody that ever came across them would know that they had the excuse that this was a wartime gun and should not be taken as a representation of the, the artisanry or the craftsmanship that they typically put into their commercial gun. So just in case you came across one and you were really concerned about that, you could be rest assured that you had a wartime finish gun and to not put any weight into that when you go buy your commercial Webley. So that's why they put that on there, which is actually kind of funny trivia. Um, but anyway, uh, Great Britain in, in the uh, Second World War was actually the only country who had only a revolver as their standard issue sidearm. And they would keep that in place until it was replaced in, gosh, I believe it was about the 1950s, uh, by the high power. So anyway, interesting history on that. Again, these are not very expensive. The Webley and the Enfield World War II revolvers tend to hover in the $500 plus or minus, depending on condition and things like that. So anyway, there is that for you, the submission from Great Britain, the uh, Webley Mark IV or the Enfield Number no. 2 Mark I and Mark I Star revolvers. Okay, last but not least, let's finish this up with Italy. What I have here is a Beretta Model 1935, single action only, small pistol. But the 1934 and 1935 models were pretty much the standard issue in Italy at the time. Now, in World War I, they had been issuing the Glicenti pistol, which was a semi-automatic, but it was much larger than this and also was more complicated to produce with tighter tolerances, was also prone to stoppages in the field. So again, the story continues like every other country in the interwar period, Italy would look at modernizing its military equipment. Now, in the 1930s, Italy had been looking at the success of the Walther PP and PPK pistols and had like, liked the ergonomics and stylizing of the design. In Germany, it was really more that the full-size 9mm sidearms were going to stay a standard issue, but in, in Italy, they liked the idea of the officer or whoever was going to carry it, carry it was going to be a very small, compact, and lightweight package that would really more or less stay out of the way and be an officer's implement, if you will, not really intending to be anything that was going to see a lot of military use or combat or anything like that. So Beretta, out of fear of losing military contracts to Walther uh, for the PP and PPK design, quickly got to the drawing board and came up with a very small uh, Italian manufactured officer sidearm and this is what they came up with. The 1935 model was a 32 ACP and the 1934 model was a 380 uh, or the 9 Quarto and those would see service actually in Italy all the way up through the 1990s. Now, as we had talked about with German service, any uh, country that they invaded or any country that they were allied with, they wanted to get uh, into production with their firearms uh, and to fold those into German military service. Uh, that was true in Spain, who was not really an ally of Germany, but they weren't a foe either. Uh, they had the Astra Model 600 and the Astra 300s that German, uh, Germany would push into the, to their service, as well as the Beretta Model 1935 model and 32 ACP. So these were contracted as well for German service. Now, German service Berettas would be noted with a 4UT stamp right back here, which this one has. So this was actually a German service Beretta Model 1935. Very interesting pistols, again, not really much. Uh, these don't really get a whole lot of press when it comes to World War II sidearm collecting. These are not very expensive. The traditional Italian military uh, Beretta 1934, 1935 models tend to hover around $500. Uh, German acceptance, again, anything tied to German military use tends to go up a little bit more, maybe in the $800 mark or so. So anyway, that'll finish it up with Italy on the model 1935 Beretta. 
Well, thank you all so much for stopping by and checking out this video. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe you learned a thing or two. If you did enjoy it, please let me know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when we are putting out new videos. I'm going to leave you guys off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.